when young adults start thinking about issues like faith, there's uh, three topics that tend to rise to the surface in the questions that they ask. First of all, uh, what does the Bible have to say about sex? Secondly, what does the Bible have to say about the afterlife? Thirdly, what does the Bible have to say about sex in the afterlife? And uh, <laughs> so it's just, and so this morning, we're going to look at the passage of Scripture that actually looks like it addresses that. We're starting a series this morning called Arguing with Jesus. Our world has really become something of an age of rant, and um, there's a lot of arguments that occur. And what uh, we need to know is that sometimes Jesus actually engaged in arguments. A lot of times he did not, but sometimes he did. So what did Jesus argue about? Who did he argue with? And so we just want to take a, a few minutes to look at that. And we are in uh, Matthew chapter 22. And it said the same, that same day, the Sadducees uh, who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told us that if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for him. Now, there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died, and since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. <clears throat> the same thing happened to the second and the third brother, right down to the seventh. Now, just think about this. Every guy that this woman married didn't survive the experience. <laughs> <clears throat> Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven since all of them were married to her? And Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So arguing is kind of like the official pastime of our culture. And the concept of arguing is that you present and exchange ideas that are very different, hoping to persuade someone. But in our culture, it doesn't feel like uh, people are trying to persuade anyone. It just feels like they're trying to talk louder and longer than someone else. And so a lot of arguments in our day wind up degrading into name-calling, accusations, and yelling. And it's almost a f as, as though our culture is afraid to hear something they don't agree with. So we don't really learn a lot in the arguments in our culture uh, except how to be embarrassed or ashamed, uh, it really, it's really not arguing, it's ranting. So arguing has uh, actually historically been like this. This is not a, a Western culture phenomenon of modern humanity. As it turns out, people have always had arguments. They've always used the same kind of strategies. And so some people came to Jesus and they wanted to engage in an argument. They wanted to argue with Jesus about life after death. And... Um, uh, if you want to win an argument, one of the things you can do is try to paint the other person's position as absurd. You want them to look silly or uh, uh, uneducated or uninformed or unintelligent. And so they set up a story to try to prove this. Now, the group that's causing this argument or starting the argument is a group called the Sadducees. And they wanted to discredit Jesus. Now, the, the Sanhedrin, which was kind of the ruling religious body in Israel, was made up of two primary groups. There was a third, but they weren't as prominent. The two primary groups were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And we have lots of interactions in Scripture that are recorded about Jesus interacting with the Pharisees. Not so many with the Sadducees, but this is one of those conversations. And what they wanted to do was to discredit him so that the Pharisees wouldn't think that highly of him. And so uh, let's give a little background on the Sadducees. They're an interesting group of people. They were part of the original priestly line of uh, uh, um, ethnic groups that, that led in priestly duties. They were often responsible for the oversight of the temple. And through the years, they had built an incredible amount of wealth. They were considered highly educated. They were the aristocrats of society. They were incredibly politically connected because they had so much money. 
And under Roman occupation, the person who served as the high priest was no longer decided by the religious leaders, it was decided by the political leaders of Rome. And since they had such access and such wealth, they could pretty much determine that a, uh, a Sadducee would be elected to that position and that would give them an edge in any religious duties, responsibilities, access to resources, as well as kind of establishing the rules of how people would live. So the Sadducees uh, almost always won that arrangement. And they, they were kind of known for what they didn't believe more than what they did believe. The Sadducees uh, only accepted the first five books of the Bible as being authentic and, and legitimate. All the other prophets, all the other poets that we consider part of the Old Testament, they rejected. They didn't think that they were uh, uninteresting. They just thought they had no uh, intense spiritual value. They did not believe in the existence of angels. They did not believe in the existence of demons. They did not believe in the resurrection. They did not believe in miracles. They did not believe in a judgment day when people would be held accountable. They did not believe that God intervened in anything. No judgment, no resurrection, no miracles, no intervention. This is a very, very, very old joke. I learned it in Sunday school. That is why they were sad, you see. Yeah. Can you imagine a, a, a mindset that just says God never intervenes? I, I had a great lunch appointment this uh, last week with a couple of missionaries, and, and he was describing to me his call into missions. He had actually started out as an accountant and, and had graduated from a university for that purpose. He had a degree, and uh, he was employed by a major corporation in the United States, and he felt God calling him to missions. And uh, he said, well, I'm happy to help support missions. And, and he felt God saying, no, I want you to go and be a missionary someplace else. And uh, so he was actually in a, a service. There was a church, and they were having a Sunday evening service. And from 5 to 6 was a time of prayer. And then at 6 o'clock, the service would begin. And so at 5, he was there, and they had a list of all the prayer needs of the church. And he went through all the prayer needs, and he still had some time left over, and he remembered this call to missions. And so he just told God. He kind of put everything back on God's plate. And this is what he said. He said, God, look, I know I have a sense that you want me to be a missionary, but as far as I can tell, there are a lot of mountains in front of me that I can't get by. And there are no open doors, and I don't have access to resources, so you are going to have to remove the mountains and open the doors and provide the resources, or I can't do it. And that was the length of his prayer. And he still had some time left over, and so he remembered that he had not done his Bible reading for the day. He, he was on a Bible reading plan to take him through Scripture. And so he turned to the passage that he was scheduled to read for that day, and it was Isaiah 45. And this is what it says. I will go before you, and I will level the mountains, and I will break down the gates of bronze and cut through the bars of iron, and I will give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. <laughs> now maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're going, well, that could be a coincidence. And it could be. But I've discovered that people who actually believe God intervenes in our lives experience more coincidences than if you don't believe that. That there's something about this. So the Sadducees didn't believe in anything. They were known for what they didn't believe. And what they did believe was the first five books. And they focused on laws and rules, particularly the rules that benefited them. How many know that's what rule keepers tend to do? And so they were really good at it, and it had, it had given them a lot of wealth, a lot of prestige, a lot of influence over a long time. And uh, so they engage in an argument with Jesus. So how do, you, how do you respond to an argument? Is there a way that you can actually deal with an issue without turning it into a rant? And, and Jesus kind of starts by surprising them, and, and he tells us, that the biggest mistakes, our biggest errors in life, come from two things. One, we do not know the scriptures. We do not know the scriptures. Our ignorance of God's word is not a benefit at any level for any purpose or any area of our life. I recently listened to a series of lectures that was put on by a clinical psychologist 
on the stories from the book of Genesis, not because he was a believer, because he in fact is not, but just for their psychological benefit. And halfway through the series of lectures, he acknowledged to a packed out auditorium that he was sorry that he had been as woefully ignorant of the scriptures as he had been through his life, and that in reading them, that he had discovered so much insight and so much truth, he said, that our culture is ignorant of them at their peril. He's not even a believer. At their peril. There's incredible truth and wisdom bound up in scripture, and there's a lot of mistakes and errors that we make because we do not know the power of God. There are opportunities that we could step into, but our fear paralyzes us, and we don't really trust beyond our own ability. And consequently, there are things that God would like to see happen in our world that do not happen in our lives because we are unwilling to step into those moments. So the basic sad you see argument uh, was put forth like this. Remember the idea is to make it look as silly as possible. So there's a guy who dies. Uh, he got married, he dies, and his wife is now supposed to marry the brother. Now here's, a, here's just something to put in here. There are people who read a scripture like this or they'll read the passage in, from the book of Deuteronomy that this law actually comes from. And what they think is that God is saying that women in the ancient world have no real legal rights or status, and therefore the only way that they can benefit anything in life is by marrying a guy who can do that for her. And God did not command that women had no legal status. God did not command that they weren't able to own property or testify in court. People did that without any of God's help. God was trying to find ways so that that woman, when her husband died, didn't wind up being a widow with absolutely no support, no property, and no options. So the laws said that if that happened to someone, she could marry a brother so that she would be able to stay where she lived and she could still, her children could still be beneficiaries of the family inheritance. So it was a way to actually help and support a woman in a very difficult cultural context. And so they said, this guy dies, and so she marries the brother, and he dies. So she marries the next brother, and he dies, until seven of them. We've had seven funerals now, and finally she dies. And their question is, of all the seven brothers in the resurrection, since you believe in a resurrection, whose wife is she? And they think they're going to trap Jesus, because, you know, they think he's going to argue, well, it would be the first one, because the, the first one is the most important one, or it's the last one, or what, whatever. And Jesus doesn't take the bait at all. Jesus actually does a very interesting thing. He requires them to think about their own position, and he provides information that they're not prepared to hear because they've already heard it, and they believe it. It's a very interesting approach that Jesus took. So... What Jesus begins to point out is that if you don't believe in the resurrection, what does that mean? You know, a lot of times in arguments, people will attack other positions, but they don't think very logically about their own position and what it means if that position is true. We can say things that sound good and clever and maybe even get some applause lines, but let's think through. Let's apply some logic, some rationale. If that is true, how would you then live? What kind of decisions would you make? And what Jesus is pointing out is that if there is no resurrection, then the only thing there is is the life that you have right now, and when it's done, it's over, and there is nothing else. So how should you live? If when you are dead, there's nothing after that, what matters? And why would it matter? And there are some people who believe that, and this is what they will say. They will say, well, since I believe that this is all there is, and when you're dead, you're dead, there's nothing after this, then our life is very, very precious. And so we should honor and respect each life because it's so brief and it's so fragile and, it's, and, and, and this is all there is, so we should honor it, we should respect it, and, and, and we should uh, do everything we can to protect it. It sounds very, very noble. But the question is, why? Why would you protect it? Well, because it's so short. Why is that an argument? You know, are, are we really going to make it? By the way, there are other people who will say, since this is all there is, 
then I will use whatever force, whatever power, whatever manipulation, whatever tools I can in order to take advantage of weaker people so that I will have more at the cost of them having less, and it will benefit me and it will benefit my family. They'll make the exact same argument. And some people go, well, that's wrong. Based on what? If there is no truth and there is no resurrection and there is no judgment and there is no life after this, then based on what? Your preference? So the whole world should do what you want because you want it? As soon as we say, all there is is my life, and when it's over, it's over, then the only thing left for you to play is God. And you will either destroy people to get what you want, or you will try to convince people that they need to be nice so that you don't get hurt. Our culture lives with this kind of logic. I'll come back to that in just a minute, but Jesus is pressing the point with the Sadducees, and so he, he's, this is what he does. He then points to something. He uses a verse of Scripture that they accept as true. When engaging in an argument, look for something you both can accept. It's fascinating to me to watch people argue on television. I have a hard time doing it for very long because I, I don't have high blood pressure, but in those moments, I get high blood pressure. And, and my heart starts beating faster, and my head feels like it's, it's going to explode, and, and they just keep talking. And if anyone says anything that the other person agrees with, you can't acknowledge that. No, no, no. And Jesus does something very surprising. He quotes a passage of scripture that they happen to believe. He doesn't quote Isaiah. He doesn't quote Jeremiah. He quotes Exodus, the book of Exodus. They accept the book of Exodus. And this is what he's, he quotes. He says... You believe, your scriptures say, in Exodus, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Notice what the scripture does not say. The scripture does not say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. God could say that, right? I was Abraham's God. I was Isaac's God. I was Jacob's God. I will be your God. He doesn't say that. He said, I am Abraham's God. I am Isaac's God. I am Jacob's God. So Jesus says, even your own scriptures say that God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And everybody just kind of went, because oh, they were all surprised. They hadn't expected that kind of response. Scripture revealed two primary things. The first is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. That was not anything that people had prepared themselves for, that they were alive. The second thing it reveals is that the reason they're alive is because of their relationship with God. They are alive because of their relationship with God. They are not alive because they were better than other people. They are alive because they had connected with the source of all life. The moment you begin to open up your heart and life to God... He begins to work eternity into you. It's an absolutely astonishing thing. When you accept and trust God, you begin to experience eternal life now. We don't experience it just when we die. We experience it when we start to believe. And so you begin even to make decisions based on that incredible and powerful truth. Now, I, I met a person last week who came up and spoke with me after one of the services, and he was describing to me after over two decades of marriage that he had lost his spouse to disease and to death. And it had been a, a devastating thing for him to walk through. And I can't imagine what that would be like. I've, I've done many funerals for people who've been in similar situations, and this is what I know. I don't know what they're going through. I empathize with what they're going through, but to say I know just because I've seen it from a distance is not the same thing at all. And so he was good. Nobody ever wants to say, I had a spouse. I had a child. Nobody wants to say that. What we want to say is, I have a spouse. I have a child. The truth is, though, that eventually, it doesn't matter how much you love someone, eventually one of you is going to say goodbye to the other one of you. You will not be the exception to that rule. 
The greatness of your love for another person will keep you faithful to them, but it will not make them live when their bodies give out and disease takes over. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way for you. It does work that way for God. When you are in a relationship with God, God never has to say, I had a son or I had a daughter. He says, I am the God, and he names your name. You are still alive in him. No matter what he is, you are God. Now, God's love gives us life. We, we experience that life based on his love, but it's also true that his, God's power enables us to change. God's power enables us to change. And this is where Jesus starts addressing uh, uh, an issue that people have read a lot into. So this is, this is some of what he says. In the resurrection, there's neither marriage nor giving in marriage, and we're like the angels. And so a lot of people have looked at that and said, so when we get to heaven, there's neither male nor female, and nobody's married. And uh, I don't think that that's the point Jesus is making. And when we read it, it's easy for us to assume that's the point he's making because that's how we think. But remember, he's talking to the Sadducees, and the reasons that a Sadducee would marry is so they can keep the family line going because they're going to, be, they're going to die and there's nothing left. So you want to keep the, the, the family line going, and you do that through marriage, and you want to continue to accumulate wealth over generations and over time, so you continue to marry. And what Jesus is saying is that when you live forever, you don't need to get married to produce children, and when you're going to live forever, you don't have to try to find someone to increase your wealth. You already have access to the incredible riches of the grace of God. So what is it going to be like when we get to heaven? And, and some of you are, are wondering, you know, will I still be married when I get to heaven? And I don't have an exact answer for you about that. My wife and I have made a commitment that we will be secretly married in heaven in the event that it is, for some reason, outlawed there. So I, I don't know what God will think about that, but I'm not going to tell him. So it's a secret. So this is what some people think. They read a passage like that, and Jesus says, and, and, and you're like the angels. Well, the, <laughs> so they read a passage like that, and what they hear is, well, eventually we evolve to something where, or, or where we become something that relationships don't really matter anymore. We're kind of beyond that. And... We've, we've just evolved spiritually, we've evolved emotionally, we've, we've evolved whatever. And, and so that's not really necessary. Like, could I put a warning label on anything that would ever indicate that the elimination of relationship as somehow an advancement in human psyche, in human emotion, in human spirituality. It is not true. It has never been true. It will never be true, including in heaven. The Bible does not say that we just don't care about each other in heaven. I don't know what the level of relationship is in heaven. We have no experience to judge it by other than to know it will be so incredibly rich and so incredibly deep and so incredibly powerful that none of us would ever choose anything else. I do believe that's true. But there's still some people in the room. Yes, but what about sex? Will there be sex in heaven? And I don't know the answer to that question. And so I, I don't really know what to tell you. You know, some, some people are very afraid that when we get to heaven, we're just all going to be friends. And we've all used that line or heard that line when someone was breaking up with us. Well, we can still be friends. By the way, most of the time, that is not true. It's just a way to get out. And that's not what heaven is like. And so what Jesus reveals is that we're not just... This, this resurrection life is not just a reanimated body. And it's not something that kind of morphs into other spiritual things so that you are not recognized. Scripture tells us you will be recognized for who you are when, when you get to heaven. Like they will, People will see you and they will know who you are. You will be known as you are known. 
By the way, I believe it will be the best you've ever looked in your life. And whatever it is that ails you or frustrates you or troubles you, all of those things will be gone. I, I don't know a lot about what it will be, but I do know that it will not be anything less than God's very best for each and every one of us. But it's not just you on life support or you reanimated. There's this power of God that brings change and transformation so that even our bodies are very different from anything that we've known now, but still very real, just so much better. We're not becoming part of some collective spiritual intellect. We're not some ethereal thing floating through the eons, you know, well, as long as someone remembers you, you're alive. That's not how God thinks about it. And maybe we shouldn't think about it that way either. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He gives us eternal life. Now, you may be listening to me this morning and, and thinking, well, I have a difficult time hearing scripture like that and hearing words of Jesus like that. And immediately there's arguments that come to your mind, and that's fine. But in the arguments that come to your mind, what I would ask you is don't just try to paint all of this as silly or irrational. And at least have the integrity to attack your own views and your own positions with the same logic that you use against positions of faith. And here's what I would say. There's a, this is what a lot of people do. They go, well, if I could just see proof, like, if I could just see what heaven looked like, if God would just kind of open a window or show me or, or do some miraculous thing. So that, and here's what I want you to see. It's not how it actually works. This is, what, this is what faith in God does not come from the miraculous. Miracles come from faith in God. That what we do is we begin to ask ourselves a series of questions. If there was a God... And if God was as good and as loving as scriptures reveal him to be and as powerful as scriptures reveal him to be, if that were true, how would I respond? And then respond. And what you discover is that God begins to work his incredible new eternal life in you beginning now. It affects everything. So... Just arguing against something you don't agree with will not help you learn anything new. And if you hold strong positions that are anti-faith or non-faith, that's fine. But use the same logic on your own positions that you would use on anyone else and stop waiting for an angel to show up and prove to you that it's all true. You discover it's true. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob discovered there was no end to their life because God was their God. We can discover that too. Let's bow our heads this morning. Uh, Father, we're so grateful for such incredible love. Thank you for your willingness to engage in the conversations and even arguments to help us learn something we didn't know before. I ask that you would give us a willingness to risk, a willingness to try, to see for ourselves if these things are so, if they're true. And to make a, a set of responses. If this were true, then I could do this. If this were true, then I would do this. Because if they're true, we can talk to you. And if they're true, we can approach you freely and boldly. And if they're true, there will never be an end to our life. Would you help us act on those possibilities so that we can discover the truth for ourselves? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.